invitation and, and, the, and the introduction. So what I'm going to do today is really just focus on the apple breeding side of my program. I also breed pear rootstocks, as Tessa said, um, but that, that's relatively new. So let's talk apple breeding uh, for Washington State. Tick. There we go. Okay. So um, just to give you a bit of a Washington State introduction, um, we are uh, the, the main university campus you can see is uh, over on the east side of the state um, in Pullman. So it's on the Idaho border, very much wheat country. And don't we know it? Um, <laughs> Seattle uh, most people have got some awareness of where Seattle is in Washington, so here just on the, the, end, the bottom of Puget Sound. I've also marked on this where our research and extension centres are, because I think as, as for a plant breeding group, um, that this is where all the, the action goes, um, apart from wheat breeding, obviously. Um, we, are, uh, we have a, a cherry breeding programme, which is down in the south of the state. Um, uh, the Irrigated Agriculture Research and Extension Centre. We have a couple of research and extension centres over on the west side of the state, uh, Puyallup and Mount Vernon, and our berry breeding is, is over there. And then I'm based slap bang centre in the state, uh, pretty much north, south, east, west, um, at the Tree Fruit Research and Extension Centre. So as you can see from this, we are right in the foothills of the Cascade Mountains um, and the the big sort of oval on there is a indication of where we see the the, the main bulk of the the apple industry in the state of Washington. So you can see that we're kind of um, pretty much in the middle north to south but but a little on the the west side of the production area. The other important thing to say when we're talking about Washington State is that for apple production, we are producing around about 60% of the US crop. So we're a, a fairly major player in terms of, of US apple production. I figured it's always kind of interesting just to, to show this. I apologize for my obvious skewing of the state image here, but um, you can see but this is the precipitation of, of Washington State and you can see just what a diverse state we are in terms of, of our, our rainfall or snow uh, for us, which is how most of our precipitation arrives. Um, you can see that we range from over on the west there, temperate rainforest on the Olympic Peninsula. Um, you can clearly see the Cascade Mountains and then if you sort of have that recollection of where, where I'm based and the, the main production area is over here in sort of central Washington, you'll see that we're, we're effectively desert, um, very, very low precipitation. Uh, and, and so all of our production is irrigated. We do have, for the moment, a, a fairly large water supply with a fairly, the, the huge Columbia River that, that flows um, down from Canada all the way through Washington State. So our irrigation is predominantly from there and from um, snow pack from the Cascade Mountains. Um, I also included on here just average temperatures, give you an idea of, um, of, of here uh, specifically in Wenatchee. Um, and then uh, the other kind of key point is our very low relative humidity. So we are a very dry place. Um, that means for our producers, of course, that fungal diseases are rarely a problem. Um, most of the main fungal diseases that impact the apple crop worldwide are, are really just not here um, and are not predicted to be here either if you start looking at projections for uh, where we might be going with climate change. We do have some disease though, and I will I'll touch on that um, a little later on. Okay, so that was my sort of overview of, of Washington State. What I'm going to do uh, for the rest of this talk, I'll give you a bit of a background about um, a, a little more sort of historical, if you like, on the, the apple breeding program. Talk a bit about targets and then go through in a bit more detail about how the program actually runs and then finish up with a bit on releases and commercialization. And hopefully leave plenty of time for questions. <laughs> um, so first of all, uh, importantly, 
apples are vegetatively propagated on a commercial level. So obviously as breeders, we're dealing with seed and we want seed to, to get that segregation of characteristics, etc. But commercially, all trees are vegetatively propagated. They're either budded or grafted um, and they're composite. So the part that I breed for, for apples is the cyan part, the aerial fruiting part of the tree. So, you know, Gala, Honeycrisp, Cosmic Crisp, all of those are cyan varieties. But at the same time, there are also rootstock varieties and the, the rootstock is the, the non-fruiting part that is all the below ground part of the tree plus about, you know, maybe six inches depending on, on how the, the, the orchard system is set up, but maybe about six inches above the ground. And growers choose the rootstock according to how they want to manage their orchard and, and their own particular um, uh, site specific needs, mostly down to uh, the, the vigor control that that rootstock brings. So as a, as a breeding program, we are for a breeding program for Apple, we're relatively young. Uh, we, we only started in 1994. Um, the, the sort of other main breeding programs across the US in, in university-based uh, are Cornell and the University of Minnesota, and they've been going for an awful lot longer than, than we have. <clears throat> um, the, the picture up there is Bruce Barrett, Dr. Bruce Barrett. He started this program in 94. Um, really, it, it was Bruce doing a huge amount of lobbying to the, the tree fruit industry in Washington and to WSU uh, that, that got this program up and running. Um, and it, before then, you know, and really up until till now, this industry, it, it's, although it's huge and very successful, it hasn't been growing varieties that have been bred and selected for what is really quite a unique climate here in Washington. So it, it was always a little bizarre perhaps that, you know, with, with an industry this size, we were not having our own varieties. So um, after a lot of lobbying, a lot of hard work, uh, Bruce brought the industry on board through the uh, Washington Tree Fruit Research Commission, who are uh, phenomenal um, supporters of tree fruit research in Washington state. They are a levy board taking levy dollars from growers um, and uh, will then turn around, accept proposals from scientists, um, and, and fund a considerable amount of very applied research on an annual basis um, for me and my colleagues and other tree fruit uh, researchers. So really it was, it was the sort of coming together of the, the industry through the research commission and uh, the university that started the program. And I've put the aim in there really just to kind of remind myself to say that our aim is it's a portfolio of new improved unique varieties so I'm not just looking for one type of apple um, and I'll talk a bit more about that as well um, obviously for our growing conditions and also very importantly that these these varieties have to be available to Washington growers WSU is a land grant university. It's our mission to support the state industries and apple, produ apple production is obviously one of our main industries. Um, and when you look back in, in the time that the breeding program started, so sort of late eight, eight, 1980s, early 1990s, still through to today, the majority of new apple varieties are released in a very controlled way with fairly expensive licenses. And many growers just can't afford to get on board. So it was vitally important that when we as a university move forward and start thinking about how we're going to be putting our varieties out there, that they were available for our growers. Okay, so this is the schema of the program. Um, I will just kind of talk you through it, just put it up here to show you that it's about an 18 year cycle starting obviously with pollination, um, as you'd expect, <laughs> um, germinating seeds, then budding those seeds onto a size controlling rootstock. Um, why do we do that? Uh, because it, we do, I mean, it's, it, it adds cost to the program, so there's got to be a good reason to do it. Um, there's a couple of good reasons, one being that putting them onto a rootstock actually helps to push the seedlings through juvenility 
and we'll get them to bloom and fruit a little sooner than if we were just leaving them on their own roots. Secondly, the other good reason is that if we didn't have some level of management through a size controlling rootstock, our seedling orchards would be horrific in terms of trying to deal with and we'd be, we'd be having trees that were uh, very different in size, need a, a huge amount of pruning and um, just, just all round a challenge. So the trees that are budded uh, on our seedlings uh, get planted out in the orchard by about year five. Um, and there we're, we're on one tree per, per genotype. Um, we move selections into a second phase, uh, really a, a big data collection phase, uh, calling them advanced selections at that point in time. And I, I will go through and um, explain these phases in, in more detail. There is a third phase where we, we really are focusing in on a very, very few elite selections, trying to get a lot of fruit uh, to really make those final decisions before we release. Okay, so targets for the program. What am I breeding for? Almost, almost exclusively eating quality and appearance. Um, very generic terms, I absolutely, understand that um, but if you think about an apple as a consumer you realize that eating quality is a very complex mix of textural traits and flavoral aroma components and we should never uh, ignore appearance because we know that as consumers we buy based on appearance um, and Although I've got a picture there of some nice shiny red fruit, it certainly is not a program that focuses exclusively on shiny red fruit. Um, appearance is something that we would, as a consumer, find attractive. Okay. Um, a little more explanation on that. When I, when I, my, my sort of kind of personal philosophy about apples and, and getting apples out to the consumer is to take on board the fact that there is, in my belief, no one apple that will satisfy every consumer. There is no one perfect apple. Everybody has their own preference when it comes to apple. And interestingly, we know that a lot of that preference is down to what you experienced as a kid, right? What, what apple varieties did you eat when you were a child? We know that there's a sort of East Coast taste. <laughs> um, we know that our West Coast growers have other other preferences. Um, so we know that, that as far as consumers are concerned, there's, there's a lot of, of variation out there. Um, and so I think this, this kind of term, the plural nature of perfection, really sums up a lot of, a lot of my mentality when I'm going forward selecting, um, selecting individuals. So, so that's the other reason why I'm always very generic in my terminology of eating quality and appearance. As well as those two traits, one that is extremely important for the Washington industry is storability. Um, as a major producer of a fresh product, it's obviously only harvested once a year, but we want to be able to sell the crop for 12 months of the year. So that means that uh, this industry has a huge investment in cold storage infrastructure and we need varieties that will stand up very well to long-term refrigerated storage and maintain the quality that they have um, earlier in the season. I've added in a couple of other um, kind of lower down traits, if you like, of, or targets. Regular cropping and high yield, yes, they're important, but for apple production, most of our cropping and yield is determined by through orchard management practices. So high yield is, is rarely a problem. In fact, most of the time our, our, our trees are producing too much and our growers have to do a lot of thinning of the crop. So um, as I said, there obviously you need to have enough apples on a tree. <laughs> but um, really high yield and regular cropping are, are secondary targets. 
And then I've also included in here just um, the, the sort of, I guess, the three, three main other challenges that we face. Resistance to sunburn, uh, apples get sunburnt. Uh, you can see that, that, that uh, brown sort of bruise looking um, area on the, the yellow apple there, that's sunburn. Um, and it uh, obviously is a challenge in our climate. Again, there are orchard management strategies to protect fruit from sunburn, but if we can select fruit that has a, a higher tolerance to, to the sun and, and doesn't burn, um, obviously that's important. And then, although I mentioned earlier on that really our, our low humidity protects us from the majority of major apple diseases, still powdery mildew, which is a fungal disease, and fire blight, a bacterial disease, are both um, here in the state. Um, yes, important, but absolutely nowhere near as devastating as they are to most of the other production areas um, <clears throat> around the world. So, so they're there in the program as a target, but <clears throat> excuse me, they don't have to be up there as being our, our kind of number one. And I just included this in really to, to remind myself to say that uh, of, of those two diseases, fire blight is the one that really, I, I guess I focused on a lot more over the last few years. Um, done a lot of work on trying to identify different sources of resistance um, and trying to understand more about levels of susceptibility and resistance um, in elite germplasm. It is a fairly easy uh, disease to screen for though uh, in, in the greenhouse on seedlings. You can see it's, it's pretty terminal, just a very simple um, inoculum there with a pair of scissors and um, cutting into seedlings. So uh, it's, it's a quick and easy one to, to test for. Okay, so, um, I've gone through targets. I'm going to talk through in a bit more detail about the, the different um, parts of the program uh, and hopefully try and sort of justify a little bit about why we do each of those phases. Um, obviously starting at the beginning, making a cross, um, <clears throat> we, we have in Apple now a, a number of different DNA tests um, for, for some obviously key characteristics. Um, I um, have been using DNA informed parental choice for uh, a number of years now. It's a clearly a way to provide a much more precise choice when you are as a breeder determining which two parents to, to attempt to cross. Um, my, where we are in Apple in terms of our, our current DNA tests is that um, this particular part of application of the D DNA informed breeding is in my opinion still by far the most effective. I have also um, had quite a few years of using DNA informed seedling selection. Um, I still am not uh, I'm not as uh, as kind of keyed in to the seedling selection as I am to the parental selection. I still believe that using DNA information to make those cross decisions at the beginning is is by far the most effective um, effective way to use it. Um, most of my seedling selection work has been done in collaboration with my colleague Cameron Peace at WSU, uh, and I, I just put up a few images here to show you the system that we we uh, we developed it was it's a little primitive but it works incredibly well we we were trying to mimic the um the 96 well sample plate and so we have this uh, bizarre little system using uh, bits of irrigation pipe that uh, to grow our seedlings in in a 96 format uh, it works incredibly well i have to say in terms of reducing um reducing errors in terms of you know which seedling goes with which sample because Fundamentally, if you can't do that, there's no point in doing the testing, right? Um, I put up here just a, a bit of a summary of a few years worth of, of what we did with, with DNA informed seedling selection. So um, you can see um, we're, we're at the sort of tens of thousands of seedlings being screened um, and projecting on what that has actually saved us in terms of the costs 
that we would have incurred by planting all of those out in the orchard. Okay, so we've, we've had our sort of uh, hopefully fairly precise choice of parents, made our crosses, grown our seedlings up, uh, maybe done a little DNA informed seedling screening, got our trees now onto our, our size controlling rootstock and, and now planted out in, into our phase one seedling evaluation orchard. Here at any one point in time, typically the program has about 15,000 unique um, trees. You can see they, they're fairly closely planted. Um, they don't look terribly tidy. <laughs> we don't spend a lot of time pruning them um, and training them to make them into uh, nice um, commercial orchard worthy looking trees because at this point really all we want to, to see is, is the fruit from those seedlings. I spent a fair amount of time trying to to improve the um, to, to, to reduce the number of errors in in the program just in terms of of tree and sample management um, I just kind of mentioned before in terms of the the DNA informed seedling selection um, the, the biggest error that I think you can make the biggest waste of money that I think you can make in doing what I do is um, is, is mixing up your, your labeling between your tree and your sample. And then you not only um, don't select uh, the best one, but you've also then moved something forward that in fact you shouldn't have moved forward. So um, we have a, a barcode system on all of our trees uh, and then take that forward into the fruit samples when we, when we collect them. So it's, it's pretty efficient. I'm not saying we don't make mistakes, but uh, it's an awful lot better than than handwriting labels. So our phase one selection is is really based on. We just kind of go back. Oh, go back to this one. Go, it's really based on us walking down those seedling rows, seeing what attracts you by um, the the fruit appearance. Um, not being too closed minded about what that appearance should be, but something that is not ugly. Okay. And then literally just um, picking an apple, taking a bite and seeing if it justifies us taking a sample into the lab for further evaluation. So pretty crude, but um, actually it works pretty well. Once we have our, our samples, uh, we store them for a couple of months in the cold because almost all the fruit that you eat will have had some cold storage. And if, an, if a sample will not manage to store for two months in the cold, it really is just not worth me moving forward for this industry. Um, this image shows us one of the biggest problems that we have in the program. It is determining optimum maturity at harvest. When should we actually harvest each seedling? Um, what you can see here is, is the sort of industry standard of determining maturity, and that is the starch iodine test. Uh, pretty fundamental, you just kind of uh, spray a, a bit of iodine solution onto your slice of apple. The iodine binds to the starch, goes black, um, and you can see as, as the apple ripens, the starch turns to sugar, um, and so then you get these, these um, pale areas within your, your slice of apple that, that shows the level of maturity. Um, we, we attempt to harvest seedlings at a similar level of maturity using um, iodine as an indicator. Obviously it's destructive and obviously when you're out there looking at those unique individual trees you don't have an awful lot of fruit to play with um, on, that, on that first go so every apple that you harvest is an apple less for you to evaluate. So um, in terms of Sorry, every apple that you harvest and, and cut up and spray with iodine is an apple uh, that you then can't, can't evaluate. So um, I would say that in fact, this, this is one of our biggest challenges, um, picking a sample of fruit that is, first of all, at its optimum maturity, and then secondly, that it's consistent across the sample. Um, we know that different apples have different clearing patterns um, between the starch and the sugar. So that, that uh, doesn't give you a huge amount of confidence in, in this. 
We've tried other techniques, obviously. Um, there is a, a, a meter that measures absorbance, the DA meter that's been around for a few years now. Um, the nice thing about this is that it's non-destructive, so you can just hold it up against the apple, um, press the button and, and you get a reading. Works very well for single varieties, but it's less efficient, um, uh, proved to be less efficient in the breeding program with the, with the range of material that we're looking at. So it's, it's always something that we're striving to do, uh, trying to find a way to best determine optimum maturity. So having got our samples at hopefully optimum maturity, stored them for a couple of months, um, we then do a, a, a series of different instrumental tests. Uh, texture is obviously really important for Apple. Um, this is a, a, a machine that just has a, a probe underneath that's, that feeds down into the, the apple after you've taken a, a little bit of peel off. Um, and it measures the, the, um, the firmness and crispness of the different regions within the, the apple. Um, and is, is actually, I personally really like the fact that it measures into that, the, the sort of R2, the, the bulk of the flesh of the apple, which um, is really the bit that you, you eat more of. So very, um, fundamental to our, to our quality uh, evaluations. We also juice samples uh, fairly standardly um, using uh, and then test for soluble solids, a reasonable indication of, of sweetness um, using a refractometer. And then we also titrate the juice for uh, acidity. Uh, on uh, apple, really uh, the, the sort of eating uh, the main um, kind of flavoral play in your mouth, if you like, is that balance between the sweetness and the acidity. So those are really just the, the two that we, we, we focus on determining. Um, we've tried NIR for this. We know that we can use NIR near infrared um, for accurate uh, measures of soluble solids, but we can't do it for acidity. We haven't managed to get a decent model for acidity. So we still have to juice the fruit. So we might as well just carry on as we have been doing um, so far, but we're always looking for some new, better way of doing this. Partly, we're always looking for a better way of doing it because we do a lot of sensory testing. And um, when you've got a lab full of apples and you literally just have to start at the beginning and taste your way all the way through, um, you can't help but think there must be a better way of doing it, but uh, so far we, we haven't found it. So um, the, my program, uh, we have a team of four of us usually that taste everything. Um, we rate on appearance um, and then various internal quality attributes um, and, then, and then give an overall quality score. Um, we have, more recently, uh, streamlined all of the evaluation systems. So we do no data entry, which is absolutely phenomenal. I have to say it's kind of part of my drive for um, trying not to ever have to do uh, data entry and writing down numbers and having transposing digits and things. So um, everything just is, is fully uh, integrated into a data entry system. And then, um, sorry, an, non-data entry system and then our data goes through into the breeders toolbox database which is hosted by the uh, the gdr the um, genome database for rosaceae again another of my colleagues dory main based in um at wsu pullman um so uh it's it's a fairly efficient setup in terms of of our data so uh, we can make selections from this phase um, and uh, then determine really, you know, is, are, are any of these individuals worth moving on to our second phase? This is our really our major data collection phase. So any individuals that are identified as selections in phase one are propagated vegetatively, um, very easy to do that in Apple, um, onto size controlling rootstocks again. And we plant in three different sites, um, uh, sort of north and south uh, and central within the production area, um, two grower sites and one WSU orchard. 
great grower cooperators, I have to say, always do a big shout out to my fabulous grower cooperators. I couldn't do this without you. Um, we put standard varieties in there so that we've got some reference to, to make comparisons with. And at any one point in time, we're looking at about 40 advanced selections in this phase. Um, not sure if I mentioned, so randomized blocks with five replicates uh, in, in each one of those, those phase two plantings. What that enables us to do is to really just kind of get in there and, and get better data on our fruit because we can get more fruit so we can do more evaluation. Um, most of our sample evaluation is very similar to what I, I uh, have already described. But because we got more fruit, we can store a sample for a little bit longer. So as well as storing fruit for two months, we can also store a sample for four months, just trying to push it out there a little bit um, to see how well these, these samples will, will um, stand up. And we then uh, run all of our data of this phase through a, a nice kind of R-based software, uh, Elite Advance, which helps us to rank all of our selections trait by trait um, and putting in the references in there. It's, it's a really, I found it to be incredibly useful way of differentiating between, between the selections. Also in this phase, because we have more fruit, we can do a little bit more, um, more with that fruit as well as our storability. Uh, I have a, a great colleague, Carolyn Ross, who is a, in the School of Food Science in WSU Pullman. Uh, she has got all the sort of sensory analysis um, uh, equipment and set up and so we'll run sensory panels sometimes on these evaluations, on, sorry, on these samples. We'll run consumer tastings and obviously I work very closely within my industry and so it's very important to get the industry on board in terms of um, getting them involved, tasting that fruit, evaluating that fruit um, as soon as we have enough fruit for them to do that. Making selections from that phase, we'll move into what we determine as our elite phase. And here, um, we might only be looking at perhaps about two or three selections at a time. Um, currently, we, we're running this on, on just two grower farms, um, sort of fairly uh, central and then south in terms of, of Washington state. Um, the aim on these is to have somewhere between about 50 and 75 trees. The grower is growing them as they would, uh, uh, bearing in mind their own preferences for orchard management. So, you know, every grower grows their trees in slightly different ways. We want to see what the grower will do with this, these selections. Um, and they're not randomized, they're just literally just planted out in, in, uh, in rows. So it's more of a a real test of, of what they would look like in a commercial situation. Um, this phase we, we do in collaboration, much more collaboration with the Washington Tree Fruit Research Commission, um, who are currently helping to fund this phase, that they are incredibly helpful in terms of providing hands-on management, um, harvesting, uh, everything with, with the fruit from this phase because it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of fruit and, be, and can really add to the amount of work that the program has to do. Much of this phase, again, is focused on harvest and storage. It really is such a key player for our industry. Um, we are interested in looking at these selections in a sequential harvest, so in other words, again gets us back to this issue of we're never quite sure about how to determine the absolute optimum time to harvest these selections. So if we can harvest sequentially, we can look at samples um, at, at different maturities. We then typically drench in fungicide just to make sure that we're gonna have enough fruit that's not rotting from some other bizarre um, uh, uh, fungus, I guess. Um, we then work with a, a, a key chemical that the industry uses, um, I guess a chemical, one MCP is one methyl cyclopropene. It is a, a widely used in our um, fruit storage industries now. It, it's an ethylene receptor blocker. 
Ethylene is the hormone, the gaseous hormone that apples produce as they ripen. Um, we know that if we apply 1-MCP into a storage space onto, onto the fruit, it blocks the ethylene receptors and it slows down the maturity of the fruit, as, uh, the, the progression of the maturity of the fruit as it's in cold storage. So it helps the fruit to retain quality. As the industry uses it widely, um, we figured that it was really important to, to look at how our selections perform with and without uh, one MCP. So obviously that's, that's a, a sort of major split in our samples. And then also we, we hold fruit in the two main different um, storage atmospheres. Regular atmosphere is just air, cold storage, refrigerated air storage. And then CA is controlled atmosphere. So much of the long-term uh, storage of apples is done under um, a reduced oxygen. So you are just really suppressing the, the respiration of the fruit in the store and really just helping it to, to maintain quality for longer. So, so it's a, you can see already that we're, we're having um, the potential for multiple samples to evaluate. And we, we do this um, with uh, partners in Stamilt, one of our biggest integrated uh, grower packer shippers, who have a lot of storage facility here in, in Wenatchee. These evaluations um, also enable us to, uh, to get growers out to have a look at the, uh, the, the selections in the field, um, you know, standing there having a discussion with a, a group of growers saying, hey, well, could you work with this tree? Does it look, does it, can you see any major issues that would be a problem for you? All of that is, is really key at this point. Um, and I have to say that Washington apple growers are fabulous horticulturalists. So, you know, they can, they can do pretty much anything. So um, it, it is phenomenal getting their feedback uh, on, on these selections in the orchard. Having enough fruit enables us to do more uh, consumer testing. Um, it enables us to run fruit through a commercial packing line. We have, we are aware that there are varieties or advanced selections that have failed to get to the industry because they they just wouldn't uh, stand up well enough for the the industrial the commercial packing line. So very important to to test our elite selections at this scale. Um, and these this this really is a a grower focused evaluation. So it, it's really um, important for us to have this partnership with the, the Tree Fruit Research Commission at this point. Um, they help us in, in terms of getting information out from this phase to, to the industry. Uh, and again, as does you know, our extension team helps tremendously on that as well. But I think one of the big things for me is that it's, it's not just then my evaluation that, that I'm putting out there. It's, it's the independent evaluation that we get from the, the Tree Fruit Research Commission. Um, I, I believe just firmly adds credibility to the data that we're putting out there and the comments that we're making out there in terms of the, the quality of the, of the selections. Um, all of which is, is just vital because for a grower to invest in a new selection is, is pretty expensive. Um, obviously, there's there's more. I, I interact with my industry a lot. We we discuss priority traits, um, and um, a, a kind of a bigger deal recently has been a lot of discussion about how to commercialise varieties out of the program. Once we've made a decision to commercialise something, um, it, it's important to not forget the propagation step. Um, buds from my phase three elite selections, I route to the, uh, the clean plant center in Prosa and they, they virus test them. So just to ensure that we've got virus tested material to distribute. Um, and then those are in turn distributed out to nurseries who will then establish mother trees uh, and start to produce um, clean buds for, for then propagation to make, to make commercial trees. Um, very important, another kind of area that, 
that I think DNA informed breeding is, is essential for is to, is to just fingerprint to make sure that the buds that we are putting out to the nursery to establish as mother trees are actually the right one. <laughs> and we haven't had a, a propagation mix up um, as, as has happened um, once or twice within this industry uh, and, and incurred some fairly large costs. So another important use of fingerprinting. Okay, so I'm going to move into the last part of this talk, really, just to, to wrap up talking about re releases and commercialization from the program. Um, WA2 is the first release from this program. It came out in, in 2009. Uh, it's a very long story apple, a nice, sweet, firm fruit. It's tested very well in consumer preference tests against Gala, which is our industry standard. Um, you can see we did this back in 2012, I mean, it's, it's a pretty strong data showing the, the overall preference of our consumers on these, these different, um, these different uh, elements. Um, we released this apple without a name. Um, it has struggled in the marketplace because, uh, really because of that, and, and growers have found it, um, growers were, were less um, willing to take the risk of, of moving forward with a new variety without, um, without more support. Uh, we have more recently named it uh, Sunrise Magic, so it, it does have a name and is starting to increase in its production. Having learnt that uh, we couldn't just release a variety out into the, to the, to the industry without more support, um, we worked very closely with our, our grower um, advisory group to determine how to release the next release which is WA38 and has come out as the Cosmic Crisp brand apple. Again um, it's a very long storing, uh, very robust piece of fruit. Uh, we did consumer testing as you would imagine with Gala originally, got great data but then at then we had comments from various growers saying, hey, well, Honeycrisp is the one that we're making the most money on now. So how does it perform against Honeycrisp? So we did that as well and got some, um, some pretty good data uh, showing the, the overall consumer preference uh, for, for um, the WA38 Apple at this point in time. We've done more work in terms of having test plantings and producing guidelines for this Apple. Um, my two colleagues, Stefano Masaki and Carolina Torres here in Wenatchee have, have helped tremendously on rootstocks, growing systems and storage information. Um, but, you know, how do you release this variety? First of all, it needed a name. Uh, oh my goodness, coming up with a name for an apple. Uh, it's not an easy thing. It's worse than naming your child because everybody tells you when they don't like it. Um, so again, Carolyn Ross uh, from the School of Food Science helped with consumer focus group discussions um, and, and hence the name Cosmic Crisp was born. Crisp, it's crisp. Cosmic because the little white lenticels on the surface of the fruit reminded somebody of stars in the cosmos. Um, it's it's kind of grown on me. <laughs> um, obviously we had to patent uh, intellectual property um, and uh, look into plant variety rights in non-US countries, but determine it actually how to release this apple to, to this industry uh, from a land-grant university, I have to say, was the biggest challenge that, uh, that we had out there. After a lot of tough decisions, a lo lot of tough discussion, um, we determined that we needed to partner up and, and do some brand development. We couldn't just put this apple out there and expect that consumers would buy it. So we partnered with a company called Proprietary Variety Management or PVM um, to, to really help us build the brand. I kind of hope that some of you might think this looks familiar because it's been out there in, it's, it's, it's well, we've kind of killed social media on this. I mean, it's been everywhere, I have to say, and we've had, um, a huge amount of publicity, um, certainly when we put the fruit, first fruit out last year. The university and PVM agreed to, to help um, fund this brand development using royalty income uh, with a figure up to just over $10 million. And we've been working very closely with our Washington marketing desks to do this. 
progress with this apple, it is a Washington only apple in the US for 10 years. So that gives our Washington growers a good head start. And you can see the progression in terms of the number of trees planted. Initially, we were limited to 600,000 because of the number of buds that were available. Um, but we're now at somewhere around about 15 million trees in the ground. Um, it's a kind of fairly scary number, you have to say it quickly. Um, and uh, our first fruit went out to sale last year. We had somewhere around about 130,000 boxes last year. Um, this year we will be having around about 1.6 million boxes. The projection for the following year is somewhere nearer 20 million boxes. Um, to put that into perspective, Washington production is usually somewhere around about 140 to 160 million boxes. Um, we're, we're down a little to this year to 125 million because we had some storm damage. Um, I, I put up here just some of the social media stuff. I mean, Cosmic Crisp has been everywhere. It's been um, uh, amazing what, uh, what a little bit of brand development will do. And we just got a good housekeeping award as well, which is kind of nice. So what's next? The program doesn't just stop, obviously. Um, more, more new varieties. Um, I kind of sh should have maybe put a few more in there that were less red. I guess there are a few that are less red, uh, just to prove that we're not just going for red. I've got a lot of yellow selections as well. Um, other outputs from the program, of course. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a professor in the Department of Horticulture. It's my job to train new scientists and plant breeders. So here are a few. Um, uh, they're a great group of, of folk that are now um, out into the, the workforce or just about to be in terms of graduation. Um, couldn't do this by myself. Uh, this is the, the current team. Um, they are phenomenal. And really, that's all I am going to say, apart from if anybody wants more information about Apple, I got sort of roped into doing this um, Burley Dodds book a couple of years ago. There's a, it is actually relatively good, I have to say, <laughs> um, uh, up to date and has got a lot of information in, in um, about uh, different different aspects of Apple. And I, I've put my email address and office phone number on there. So if anybody um, wants to get in touch at all, I'd, I'd be more than happy. So, sorry, I kind of ran on a bit, but we've got a few minutes of questions. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Evans. That was very interesting. Um, just as a reminder, as you ask questions, to, we would like a student to ask the first question. I've stunned them into silence. They're bashful. <laughs> Ellen, I think the rule is as a host, if the if, if somebody doesn't respond, you gotta come up with a question. But no pressure. No pressure. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Appreciate it. I uh I would share uh a question. We try to have the students ask one first, but uh, but I have a question as to how do you use, how do you preserve your woodstock and that kind of thing? How you maintain it? Uh, do, is it all in the field or do you do use cryo preservation or what techniques do you use? Oh yeah, good question. Um, so um, Cryopreservation in Apple is uh, fairly advanced and genetic resources for the US collection have been partially backed up using cryopreservation up in um, Colorado. Um, Gail Volk is, is leading that effort. But for the breeding program, no. I mean, it's, I, I really, I, I have a, a collection of trees. Um, it is one of those things that obviously you have to kind of keep on top of because it gets more expensive the more you have. Um, and so uh, every so often I will, uh, I will remove some as, as well as I'm always adding to it. Uh, but uh, yeah. So based on how long it takes to get an apple variety released, what is your goal for how often to have a variety? 
That is a really good question. Um, so when I first started here, I was floored by one, a question that somebody said to me, so how many varieties will you be releasing a year? Um, and they were a little surprised when I looked surprised. Uh, and I, I was thinking, oh my goodness, um, you actually expect a variety a year or more than one variety a year? Um, the, the likelihood is that I think maybe about every five years a variety is, is a reasonable target now looking at the um, lo looking at everything that's that's involved um, you know when you when you're first releasing a, a, a new product from a university that has had no experience in dealing with something like Apple um, every, you, you really got to start from scratch in terms of determining how to do it now we're a little more aware so one would hope that the next one won't be um, as traumatic to sort of get out there. <laughs> Do y'all have any plans to uh, use any kind of uh, gene editing technology in your breeding program at all? Yeah, that's, a, uh, again, yeah, good point. Um, we tried to get some funding to do some work um, uh, with uh, rapid cycle breeding, just uh, just to kind of, not not gene editing but again the the product is non-gm um and failed when we when we were discussing that with the industry um i think that gene editing we're starting to see a little bit more positive uh view from from the industry um and uh, are just literally uh preparing a, a proposal in collaboration with uh, another of my co colleagues, Amit Dingra, to, to do some exploratory work uh, in terms of gene editing in Apple. So I'm not a cotton guy, but one of the things I read about uh, the development of the cotton harvester was that breeders actually had to modify the plant. And when I think about all the cool technology that's coming out, um, probably one of the coolest is apple harvesting. Um, and I didn't hear you talk about this. Are you are you having to redesign the plant or do some specific breeding for automatic apple harvesting? Um, yeah, you're, you're absolutely correct. There is a huge amount of work that's going on in terms of trying to automate the apple harvest. Um, it's a, it, it is the principal target for the industry. Um, really, the majority, if, if not all, of the um, manipulation of the, of the tree to, to enable it to be automatically harvested can be done horticulturally. Um, the management, uh, the, the ability for the grower to, uh, to choose an appropriate size controlling rootstock, um, to, to grow a tree and manipulate exactly where its branches are by using different training systems. Uh, it, I mean, it is absolutely incredible what can, you know, it, just really what can be done. Um, you know, how can you, uh, I, I guess one thing that we have seen is, is does, does the length of the stem and the way that the apple is attached to the tree make a difference in terms of the automatic harvester? Quite honestly, we don't know yet. And until there is some further kind of uh, decision about which direction the harvest is going to go and how exactly it's going to harvest the fruit. Um, it's, it's not really, it, it's very difficult from a breeding perspective to say, okay, well, I'm going to go for that type of, of stem as opposed to that type of stem, you know? Um, but it, yeah, I mean, it's something that certainly is, um, we are aware of and it is part of the discussions with industry, but, but really, I mean, the manipulation that you can do to a tree in the orchard is phenomenal. Dr. Smith has his hand up. Uh, Kate, I have about a half dozen questions written down, but time is getting short. I'd like for you to take a, a, a minute and tell the students something about the Plant Breeding Coordinating Committee that you've been Absolutely. involved in. Yes, yes, sure. So this is where I, I have got to know Wayne as well, which is really neat. So. Um, so the, the US has a number of uh, multi-state coordinating committees and um, the Plant Breeding Coordinating Committee is one of those. We are a, 
a, a way to sort of communicate the issues and challenges of um, public plant breeders through to um, NIFA and USDA and sort of, you know, kind of higher level government administration. Um, one of the main areas that I have uh, I have, I've done recently was to uh, try and, and get, get a grip on surveying how many public plant breeding programs there are in the US now and whether they are, um, as was feared, declining in number um, and uh, struggling for funding and all the, the usual kind of questions. Um, and we just, we just put out a, a, a paper in crop science summarizing that and, and as, as I think all of us as public plant breeders were were, um, were, were sort of fearing the um, yeah our, our public plant breeding capacity is declining uh, across the U.S. So um, it was kind of good to to get some some real numbers on it. And the view is it, it's been established now that we can we can repeat the survey. Um, it's an online survey. We can repeat it every four or five years to just kind of track to see what is actually happening. Um, not not just because of the value of public plant breeding programs, because of course they're producing varieties, but also they're producing plant breeders, right? And so, um, you know, you need to have those public plant breeding programs to to train our our next generation. Hey, Kate. This is this is Dave Byrne. Good to see you. Hey, nice to see you too. Uh, one question, uh, and I missed part of your seminar because it was someplace else, but uh, what, what kind of efforts are you, you making into more of the specialty apple market, like the red flesh, the, the, what they call the miniature snacking types, and whether you can, you know, I, I, I teach a course and we're looking at the snacking type varieties, and some are just small versions of the normal variety, but some, you know, I, I think there, there's possibilities in actually evaluating or, or selecting for smaller but higher quality apples for that market yes um, it's not a it's not a major focus of the program but it certainly is something you know I have to kind of balance the um, the needs of this industry which is it is huge um, mm -hmm. with 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 the other things that have, we all know as breeders <laughs> appear from time to time right um yeah. and so uh it is certainly something that i am you know now having got a mainstream variety out there i i, I feel it just enables me to to explore perhaps some of the potential of some of these other other things um i do have a neat pink fleshed apple called sunburst which is was i was had to leave it behind in my former job. It's it's in the UK. It's been produced in the UK, and uh, it is it is starting to to get a bit of a presence over there. Um, so that's 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 kind of nice to see. Well, we have reached the end of our time, and I know that people have different places that they need to be, but um, really appreciate your time, Dr. Evans, and uh, very interesting. I've enjoyed hearing about it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And if anyone has any other questions, just shoot me an email. I'd be more than happy to, uh, to provide some more information. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay.